thank you first and foremost for, for coming to have this conversation. Uh, I think that uh, I represent all of us in being very appreciative of the fact that you'd spend your time, especially taking a red eye here, and then having to have to rush right out. <laughs> Technology and financial journalists have talked about the way that software and technology has transformed industries. Like they'll talk about the way Amazon has fundamentally changed the way retail works. Um, the, the thing that's interesting is that not only have we seen the technology chain industry, it seems like technology leadership is starting to go into industries as well. So you could say like Bill has been trying to, Bill Gates has been trying to change philanthropy and that you know, Jeff Bezos and Pierre Omidyar are, and Chris Hughes are, are now going into media, and that you and Mark Cuban have gone into the NBA. Uh, do, you, do you see things that are endemic traits of technology leaders? And, and let's just talk about the NBA, like technology leaders that helps to push the, the envelope uh, in, in this type of a context? Hard to know. I mean, look, the, the hot, businesses of the last 20 years have been tech businesses and financial services businesses. Tech and financial services. So of course you got a lot of great talent. What, what's this conference about? This conference is about, in some senses today, recognizing that there's a lot of hot opportunities and a lot of hot talent in financial services in the African American community. Where does that go next? What's the next frontier? What's the next opportunity? Same thing in tech. It's a little less centered in the, in the program, but when Reverend Jackson and I sat down in L.A. after you guys beat us uh, the next day, you know, the thing, the thing <laughs> we talked about is what does it mean to have more opportunities uh, in the tech industry for, for people of color? How's that really going to happen? How do you get after on the technical side? How do you get after it so that kids are more involved early in their lives? And as the Reverend said, on the non-technical side, we got to be doing that. There, there, there doesn't need to be as much lag time. One of the initiatives I was most proud of, I didn't come up with, but most proud of uh, that we did at Microsoft is we put a rider in all of our uh, outside law firms' contracts. And if you look at what our legal department, our Microsoft's legal department spent at the time I was there a year ago, so everything's out of date, you know, 85, 90% of the spend was spent outside. And we had a rider. So you, you know, any law firm that wants to do business with us has to have a minimum number and commitment from, for diversity in those law firms. We just wouldn't do it without it. I, I didn't come up with the idea, but it seems consistent with some of the themes that Reverend Jackson's talked about, we were talking at our table about at lunch, and, and it's certainly a profession where it can be done. Tech, which, you know, engineers, we've got to get pipeline moving. Lawyers, plenty of lawyers. We've got one of the, I think, one of the great leaders in sports, Stock Rivers, to do that. We just hired, I think, maybe the only uh, female president for the business side uh, in professional sports, a lady named Gillian Zucker, <laughs> who we hired because she was awesome. But when I see other women greet her, I know it's a little more special than, than just that, uh, which, is, which is great. But the real question is, where do we go? What's our environment look like? What's our fan base look like? Uh, how, do we, how do we be a, a more positive and productive force in our community? I mean, look, there's so many kids who grow up. If you grow up in LA uh, you're, you know, and, and you like basketball, which you know, a lot of kids like basketball, more like basketball than soccer or almost anything else in the United States, how does the fact that we have a basketball team with inspirational guys like Chris Paul and Blake Griffin and DeAndre Jordan and Jamal Crawford. How does that help inspire kids? Uh, may, maybe not teach them the economics and the computer science, but if we can get them on the track and get them in the program, and we're asking ourselves that question. Uh, at the same time, the guys do have to play some basketball. So Doc reminds me we better not have them in schools every day. Uh, they, they, they got real jobs to do too if they're going to continue to be the inspirations to, to these kids. Are there any other things that throughout that process, you know, of trial and error that you thought might be interesting advice yeah. or learning that you'd like to share? Yeah, I'll say two or three things. Number one, nobody's made such incredible progress that they should break their arm patting themselves on the back. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. It's like Dan Gilbert in Detroit. He's got to try. We'll see what happens. He's got to try. And 
it gets you to the first principle of almost anything in business. I didn't used to believe this actually, not just about diversity, I didn't believe it about anything, but you really do get what you inspect. And so you better have processes in place to have a real discussion, not just a let's look at the number once a year type discussion, but real processes to ask whatever the questions are and go through them. We, Denmark reminded me of this when we were just briefing for this thing. We started a thing oh, probably 10 plus years ago at Microsoft called People Review. It wasn't a diversity review, it's a people review. Who's our talent? Where are they going? What's the depth? What's the pipeline? But we decided at the time we had to have a specific call out. What was our pipeline look like specifically of underrepresented minorities? Because in the way the, some of the government taxonomy works, you can put a lot of people together and lose some people in that formula. So we're going to look at that. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about specific people, individuals, their careers. In a company of 100,000 people, that's a lot of people. And diversity does mean different things outside the United States, frankly, than inside. And we're a global company. In Japan, it actually means mostly looking at women. In France, means a different set of things, but in the United States, I think it's pretty clear uh, to people what, what that means. Does that solve the problem? No, I guarantee you can't solve the problem though if you're not asking the questions, inspecting, and having, uh, having the discussion. Uh, you gotta take some bets. People who may not, you do this in everything in business. You always bet on somebody who's not necessarily 100% proven. If you don't bet on people who are not 100% proven, you're not gonna hit the big, the big, you know, the big swings. You get the little nice little bunts, unless you bet on, I mean, you bet on guys who are proven winners, that's probably a pretty smart thing. I got to say that particularly since, you know, I bet on Doc, uh, you know, Cleveland's bet on LeBron. There's some things that are probably worth betting on uh, that are proven, but you want to take some risk and make some bets. I think that's, uh, that's a very important thing. The other thing is, I think you want to make sure you're being precise in the way you think about things. The issues in the technology industry and expanding diversity are different in the engineering community, frankly, and I think Reverend Jackson's spot on about this. They are different in the engineering community where we need to build long pipeline back into the elementary schools and high schools for engineers than it is in sales and marketing and some of the other professions. And that, that sort of sets you free because then you can, you put different strategies, different tactics, different approaches uh, my wife and I have invested in a thing called Code.org, and I'm not selling Code.org for, for your own you know, giving, but Code.org tries to get kids in high school interested in programming. When I started, the theory was we just had a shortage of engineers in America. I told the guy after a couple years, I think the problem's going away. He says, well, we changed the problem. Now we got to get after not just the kids who would always get in the tech, we've got to get after the kids who might not because they're in a family or a school environment where that opportunity isn't necessarily going to pop. So we just got to keep after. Steve, on behalf of everybody, I want to thank you. <laughs>